Is this the most important equation in railway track engineering? If it is, which I argue it is, this makes this number here the most important number in track engineering. But where does it come from? Why is it that number? And is that the best number? Welcome to the Peatway Engineer, the YouTube channel where I cover all things railway engineering. This equation is used to work out the equilibrium cant for a curve at a specific radius at a certain speed. Cant, the lifting of one rail above the other, is applied to the track by engineers to manage the lateral forces that act on both the train and its occupants when it travels around a curve. Equilibrium is a state of balance between opposing forces. This is when forces acting on the same object in opposite directions are equal. For an object to be stationary, all the forces on it must be equal, otherwise it would move. This is fundamentally captured in Sir Isaac Newton's first law of motion. Equilibrium cant is the value of cant which, when applied to the track, means the resultant force is perpendicular to the plane of the running rails. Now, if this doesn't make sense, don't worry. Keep watching as I will explain all. A note here, and it is important to remember, this equilibrium cant value calculated is only valid for the speed and curve radius used in this calculation. Change either the speed or the radius values and the equilibrium cant value changes, but the number where does it come from? Here we have a train sitting on a flat, straight track. Let's say we have an object sitting on the train floor at point A. We will look at the forces on this object. It could represent a passenger or an item of freight. The force acting on it is its weight. This acts directly down. Weight is calculated by timesing the mass in kilograms by gravity. It can be said that this train is in equilibrium, that the force from the weight of the train and this object is spread equally on both rails with no other force involved. When the train is on a curve, however, lateral forces come into play. This is centrifugal force. This brings us on to the first of a few engineering or mathematical concepts we will need to go through in this video, and that's resolving and resultant forces. In physics and engineering mechanics, an object may have several different forces acting on it, like we have on our trains. These forces can have different strengths and directions. The resultant force is a single overall force that replaces all the individual forces acting on an object found by adding all of the individual forces together. This is known as resolving the forces. If all the forces balance, the resultant force is zero. This means the object is either stationary or at a constant speed. A simple example is a child pulling a trolley with a piece of rope. They will pull it at an angle. This is the resultant force, the overall force going up the rope, but it can be broken down into a horizontal and vertical force known as component forces. These will then add to form the resultant force. Two component forces together have the same effect as the single resultant force. Let's go back to our train. With the lateral force introduced, if the forces are resolved, the resultant force acting on our object now acts towards the outer rail on the curve. This pushes the object that way and increases the force on that high rail. This is a move away from the equilibrium or balance that we had when the train was on flat track. This is resolved by applying the right amount of cant. This brings the resultant force direction back to straight down, into or perpendicular to the track. The amount of cant on the track that results in the resultant force acting straight into the track it is the equilibrium cant. That is why cant is applied to railway curves. But to get to the constant number, we need to take it up a notch or two on the complexity scale. We also need to add a bit more detail onto the diagram, including some component forces. Our components are going to go either parallel to the floor of the train and the plane of the rails, or perpendicular to it. Remember how when our train was on the flat, this was the case? Starting with the object, we have the centrifugal force acting outwards. This can be broken down into its two components. Notice that we are creating triangles. To make this a little easier, I'm going to label each point on the triangle. So A stays as it is. Let's call these points J and K. The combination of the letters tells you which line I'm referring to. AK, for example, is the centrifugal force. So, that's our outward force. Onto our other triangle originating at A. Straight down to point C, we have the weight of the object. This is also known as mg, mass in kilograms times gravity in meters per second. That is the resultant. Let's put in our components. Remember one in the plane of the rails and the floor, while the other one perpendicular to it. That also gives us point B. So, what else do we know and is important in this diagram? Well, the cant is important, so let's put that on there. We also know the distance between the centre lines of the rails, commonly referred to as S in equations. Let's complete that triangle too and label up the corners I, 
O and F. Now let's list out what we already know on the side here. AC is NG, which is mass times gravity. OF is the applied cant. Let's call this EA. IO, the distance between the center lines of the rails. S, which is 1502 millimeters or 1.502 meters when we have a 1432 millimeter track gauge. AK is our centrifugal force. Now I left this until last as it requires a little explanation of how we determine this force. Newton's second law states that a force on an object is linked to the object's mass and its acceleration. This gives the famous, to engineers and science people at least, equation F equals MA. We all know acceleration as when something changes speed, like in a car. However, in the world of engineering and physics, acceleration is actually defined as the change in either the size or direction of the velocity of an object. Velocity is a speed with a direction. Our train is going around a curve. Even when it's going around a curve at a constant speed, it's still changing direction. So, by the definition of acceleration I just introduced to you, it is accelerating. This acceleration is defined as the speed squared divided by the radius. So if we sub this into our F equals MA equation, we get the centrifugal force as M times V squared over R. Let's put that alongside everything else we know. If you want to know more about the link between speed and forces on trains, it is covered in the first part of my Horizontal Geometry Basics email course. It's free and all you need to do is pop in your email and you'll get a week's worth of emails introducing you to the basics of railway horizontal geometry. If you'd like me to do more videos on some engineering and physics principles, such as acceleration or resolving forces, please let me know in the comments. The aim of this channel is to help you guys increase your engineering and railway knowledge, so let me know topics you want me to cover. If you look at the triangles we've created on the diagram, you'll notice two things. Firstly, they're all right angled triangles. Secondly, you'll notice they're all of a similar layout and proportion, with a long base and hypotenuse and a short other side. Let's introduce you to the theory or rule, I'm not sure which it is, of similar triangles. If two triangles have the following two properties, then they are considered similar. The corresponding angles are the same. The corresponding sides are proportional. If two triangles meet these criteria and are said to be similar, it means they are related through a ratio. So through this relationship shown on screen, you can use known lengths on one triangle to work out the unknown lengths on the other. This can be very helpful on resolving forces. And guess what? The three triangles we have on our diagram are similar. So this means we can use the similarities and the known parameters we have to help solve for the unknowns we have. Make sense? At the beginning of the video, I spoke about equilibrium and how it's a state of balance. I also spoke about how at equilibrium can, the overall force was perpendicular to the plane of the track. Let's look at our components. Both BC and JK are acting straight down into the track, perpendicular to the plane of the rails. They will combine to form the weight, MG. AB and AJ are our lateral forces. Note that they are opposite each other. Now, if we want the overall force to be straight into the track, there cannot be any lateral force. If there is any lateral force, it will push the train towards either rail. So that means both AB and AJ need to be equal as well as opposite so that they can cancel each other out. So we would add them together to make zero. But how do we know what AB and AJ are? Well, that's where our similar triangles and what we already know comes into play. Let's find AB first, given B becomes before J in the alphabet. We can take points J and K off the diagram for the moment to keep things clear. If we apply the ratios of similar triangles for each similar side, we get this relationship, where IO over AC, our hypotenuses, equals OF over AB, our short sides, equals IF over BC, the bases of our triangles. Remember when we said we knew some of these forces? Let's put them in. IO is the distance between our rail centres, S. AC is MG, which is our mass times gravity. OF is our applied cant, EA. So that's half our equation subbed in. AB is what we're looking for. Let's call this LI for lateral inward force. BC is the force going down into the track. Let's call this PI perpendicular and inwards. Just so you know, LI and PI are just letter combinations I've picked. You could use any that makes sense to you. So that leaves us with IF. Now, do you remember Pythagoras' theorem? Really stretching that maths brain right back to school now, aren't we? Trust me, I've had the same thing when looking into all of this. Pythagoras' theorem says that if you have a right-angled triangle, 
the lengths of the sides are linked, with the square of the hypotenuse being equal to the squares of the other two sides added together. So, we know that OF is EA and IO is S. Put them in and rearrange gives us IF equals the square root of S squared minus EA squared. Let's put that into our similar triangles relationship. Now, remember we wanted to find LB, or LI as we have renamed it, we want this to be in terms we know, so let's take S over MG equals EA over LI and rearrange to make LI the subject. We now know the force acting inwardly. We now need the force acting outwards, AJ. Let's clear off the other triangle ABC for some clarity here. And let's apply the similar triangles again. Nice, and finally let's label up again what we already know. We can put in IO, IF and OF from our previous work through, nice and easy. Then AK is our centrifugal force, which if you remember back to earlier in the video is found from MV squared over R. So that leaves us with AJ and JK. Again, let's label them up. Let's have LO for the lateral outward and PO for perpendicular outward. Lovely. Again, we're gonna focus on the lateral force. So take the S over MV squared over R equals the square root of S squared minus EA squared all over LO and make LO the subject. We now know both of our lateral forces in terms of parameters we know. Now remember what we said about the lateral forces being equal to each other, so let's do that. Our EA value for Kant is very small compared to the track gauge. Kant is often tens of millimetres compared to over 1500 for the gauge. For every use, I mean within reason, that you would see on the railway with the values of Kant that we come across. The square root of S squared plus EA squared over S is going to come out as very nearly 1, so let's put it in as 1. I'll explain the limitations of the equation at the end of this video and why we can do this substitution should become clear. This then leaves us with this equation. Given we have M on both sides, we can cancel that out. This is starting to look a bit more manageable, don't you think? Now, we want to know the Kant value required to achieve equilibrium. So let's make EA the subject of the equation and tweak it to EQ. EA is commonly used for the actual value of Kant, while EQ is for the equilibrium Kant value. Now, let's get some numbers in there. A bit refreshing being back to numbers after all of this algebra, don't you think? S for 1432mm track gauge is 1502mm. This needs to be converted into metres as the speed and the gravity value are both in metres per second. Next, we have G, gravity, which comes in at 9.807 metres per second. Put them in and solve, but it's still not 11.82 though, right? Well, this equation would give us our equilibrium Kant value in metres, not what is commonly used to measure Kant. The speed is also in metres per second, when it is common to have it in kilometres per hour. So let's change that, to make the equation easy to use with the numbers we'll commonly come across. First, we need to get from metres per second to kilometres an hour. For this, we need to multiply the speed in metres per second by 3.6. Commonly, speed in kilometres per hour is shown as a capital V, rather than the little v we have been using so far. Second, is changing the cant from metres to millimetres. For this, we times by a thousand. So let's sub both of these in and sort out the number. And there we have 11.82. It needs to be remembered that this equation has some limitations and simplifications embedded into it. This is to keep the equation easy and simple to use, but also, as we saw with the square root of s squared plus ea squared over s, some factors make such small overall difference. But it's worth knowing these limitations. First up is the obvious one if you don't work in an area with 1432mm track gauge. The constant for 1435mm track gauge is actually 11.84. In a number of places, 11.8 is used, something to be aware of. In terms of simplifications, through this process of getting to the equation we have disregarded a number of key points of vehicle dynamics and behaviour. We've not taken into account suspension, bogey movement or angle of attack, vehicle acceleration or braking to name a few. This helps keep the equation simple to use, and we cannot say it doesn't work given the many years it's been in common usage without issue. I'm sure this equation will become something that you use most commonly in your railway track geometry journey, and it's important to know where it comes from, even if you don't have to derive it every single time. If you want to know more about Kant, how it's used, and the difference between applied Kant and Kant deficiency, why not check out my complete Guide to Kant video shown on screen now. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to give this video a like, drop any comments below, and hit that subscribe button.